that's it's all good. Okay, so uh, good morning, one more time. Uh, welcome back to uh, summer school, uh, day three. Uh, we have also very interesting sessions today. Uh, they will also run in parallel. Um, and as uh, usual, we will do first the plenary where the presenters will tell us about themselves a bit and about uh, their blocks so that you can make an easier decision in which block to go. Um, so I don't want to take too much more time. I would like to invite uh, here with us uh, Professor Hannah Mayer. Um, so we are very happy to have uh, Hannah with us. Uh, and she came um, uh, also from uh, Munster, uh, where she leads the uh, remote sensing lab. Um, and so we're very happy to hear her. She's been to a couple of summer schools, so she knows all about them. Uh, and she's going to talk about the machine learning for Earth observation. Um, and, and after that, I will uh, invite uh, Danius Mausilinas and uh, Paula Moraga, who will also uh, present their uh, blogs for today. So please, uh, uh, Hannah, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, yeah. Good morning to everyone, and um, it's working. Yeah. Okay. And um, thank you, Tom, for the invitation to present here again um, at the summer school this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To quickly introduce myself, and Tom already said it. Um, so my name is Hannah Meyer, and I'm leading the working group for remote sensing and spatial modeling at the Institute of Landscape Ecology um, in Münster, and I'm mainly working on developing and applying machine learning strategies in the context of remote sensing-based monitoring of the environment. Um, and what I want to do in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes is to give you a short introduction into the topic of the workshop that will take place um, right after this plenary session. Um, and the title of that workshop is Machine Learning for Earth Observation. But I would like to put special focus um, on a topic of mapping the area of applicability of spatial prediction models, which is a new project that I'm currently working on together with ETSA. Um, but I'm going to explain what I mean by the term area of applicability later on in this um, short presentation here, because um, I think before we go into the very details of um, how we train and validate machine learning models, let's um, first start with talking about why we might be interested in applying machine learning in the context of environmental monitoring. And um, yeah, the background is that in environmental science, we're often interested in spatial and spatial temporal dynamics of environmental variables, like for example, climate dynamics or um, biodiversity patterns, patterns of soil properties, um, or maybe vegetation characteristics. So we're interested in spatial and spatial temporal dynamics of environmental variables. But now the problem is that um, the data that we usually have available from field work are only point data, for mm -hmm. example, from climate stations, from plot um, based vegetation records, soil profiles, or maybe local um, animal trapping. So the problem is now um, that we get the information about the environment at the locations of um, these field um, measurements or these field survey um, sites, but initially we do not know anything about the environmental variables in between um, these sampling locations. And therefore our key question is now, how do we um, yeah, fill the gaps between the sampling locations to create spatial continuous maps of environmental um, variables. And here, obviously, remote sensing comes into play because it provides us with information in a spatial continuous way. So for example, when we start with a um, very high spatial resolution, we can acquire um, data based on UAVs that give us information in a very um, detailed way about the environment. Um, or for example, LIDAR data taken um, from airplanes can um, give us additional information about the vegetation structure or new satellite systems like Sentinel-2 together with the long time series of Landsat provides, provide us with optical information in a spatial continuous way that are available since um, yeah, the 1970s. And um, yeah, finally, uh, sensors on board of geostationary satellites like Meteosat um, offer a very high temporal resolution, which is relevant when you want to monitor um, yeah, processes that are very dynamic in time. So for example, weather phenomena. So um, remote sensing provides us with information in a spatial continuous way, but um, for now, this information are only reflectances in certain wavelengths, but we don't know anything about the environmental variables that we're interested in yet. 
So therefore the question is now, how can we translate the information that we get from a satellite to what we're actually interested in um, from an ecological perspective? And um, the way we can do that is to assume that our remote sensing um, data serve as um, predictors for the environmental variables that we're interested in. And this can be quite obvious for some variables that are directly linked to the satellite signal, like for example, vegetation cover. So vegetation cover can very well be reflected by the visible and near infrared channels um, that we get from a satellite. So what we can do um, is like we see here that we um, set up a simple parametric model between here on the X axis, our remote sensing um, derived variable, the NDVI in that context and here on the Y axis um, field sampled vegetation cover. So what we can do, for example, is to um, yeah, calculate a simple linear model and um, yeah, to each um, regression model belongs a regression equation and we can apply that regression equation to each pixel in our remote sensing data set to um, create a spatial continuous map of vegetation cover that is based on the linear relationship here between um, the NDVI and um, the field samples. So that seems to be pretty easy for variables that are directly linked um, or can be directly reflected by the satellite um, signal. However, for most um, problems in ecology, that relationship is not that obvious. So for example, when we think about variables like um, biodiversity or rainfall patterns or um, maybe carbon in the soil, um, these are variables that are much more complex to assess and they usually cannot be estimated by such a simple um, function. So instead, what we need here are um, um, models that are able to deal with a large variety of different um, information that we can get from remote sensing um, data sources. And we need models that are able to deal with very complex and nonlinear relationships between um, these variables. And this cannot be fulfilled by the parametric model. So instead we move on here towards the machine learning way of modeling environmental variables. And machine learning now has a very great advantage and this is um, that we don't make a priori assumptions about the relationships between predictor variables. And this allows us that we can feed in a large um, yeah, variety of different um, remote sensing um, data here that we assume might have a relationship with our um, target variable that we would like um, to monitor. So the idea is that we feed these predictor variables here into the machine learning algorithm and the task of the algorithm is um, then to learn the relationships between these predictor variables and our um, yeah, target variable that we call response variable here um, by itself. And in this way, it's possible um, that we can, or that the algorithm learns um, arbitrary and nonlinear relationships between the predictors and the response variable. And then based on the learned relationships, the algorithm creates a model and we can then um, again take up that model and apply it to each pixel in our remote sensing data set to make um, again spatial continuous predictions. But this time these spatial predictions rely on complex and nonlinear relationships between um, the variables. Um, and this method has become quite a popular tool in the context of environmental remote sensing, as we can see here um, in a heavily increasing numbers of publications that use machine learning in the context of environmental remote sensing. And especially in the very um, last few years, so two or three years, four years, um, for example, um, machine learning has become very popular to um, model environmental variables, even on a global scale. So by combining remote sensing and machine learning, um, a large variety of different global data sets has been created, for example, on soil properties, on abundances of microorganisms, biodiversity patterns, or um, tree restoration potential, to mention just um, a few of very many examples that um, have been created um, on this or similar workflows. So when we have a look at the um, diversity of different variables um, on global variables um, that have been um, uh, created based on combining remote sensing and machine learning, we might increasingly get the impression here that machine learning serves as a kind of um, yeah, magic tool to basically map everything um, and everywhere. Um, however, there are also increasingly doubts about the quality of the results created in, us, in that way that um, recently led to um, many newspaper and scientific um, journal articles that um, explicitly question the global maps that have been created that way. So for example, here in a German newspaper, when the KI daneben leaked, meaning if artificial intelligence is wrong, or um, researchers find flaws in high profile study on trees and climate that explicitly addresses one of the um, global data sets mentioned on the previous slide, or um, here a scientific um, um, paper published in Nature that is questioning the robustness of the methods in more general with the title Deep Trouble for Deep Learning. So there are increasingly doubts about the quality of the um, results created um, of, the, of the results um, um, yeah, when we apply machine learning 
um, to remote sensing data that might lead us to the question if we have been too ambitious by applying machine learning to basically map everything. And as a consequence, um, the need to identify why our models might fail in making reliable um, spatial predictions. And um, what we have learned in that context so far, and I refer here mainly to um, um, yeah, what has been discussed at the previous Open Geo Hub Summer School last year, and you also find the slides online if you want to go into more detail here. Um, so what we have learned is that um, machine learning is applied to um, spatial data and remote sensing data, mainly in the same way as in other fields like medicine, economy, and so on, without taking into account um, the characteristics of spatial data. But our remote sensing data obviously have characteristics that make them stand out against other data sets, and that's especially spatial, but also um, temporal dependencies in the data. And what we, what we have learned is that um, we cannot ignore these characteristics in our data, and that we have to take um, the spatial dependencies into account if we want to apply machine learning in a way that it's creating um, yeah, reliable spatial prediction models. To be a little bit more specific here, what we have um, learned and what we have also seen at the summer school last year is that um, um, yeah, standard validation procedures, so when we validate our models just based on um, the default way of validating our machine learning models, that this can lead um, to a very over-optimistic view on the prediction performance if we ignore the spatial dependencies in our data, and that um, therefore spatial validation is very essential to provide reliable error estimates about um, or on our um, machine learning um, models for spatial data. We have also seen um, that spatial dependencies can lead to misinterpretation of um, predictor variables that can lead to very weird and strange um, prediction patterns that are caused um, um, yeah, by misinterpretation um, due to the um, spatial dependencies in our data and that we therefore need to apply spatial variable selection as well to only select variables that are meaningful um, for creating spatial continuous maps of our um, response variable. So when we take um, that into account, um, we can create models that are best able to make um, predictions beyond the locations of our training samples so that we can create reliable or um, most reliable um, maps based on um, remote sensing and machine learning. And we can also communicate the error in a um, objective way. However, um, it is a question of this is sufficient for reliable global mapping of environmental variables. Because what we do when we um, apply machine learning to remote sensing data is that we usually train and validate our models um, based on field samples. However, when we have a look here at um, typical locations for field samples, we see that there are usually large gaps, um, for example, here where we make predictions for, but where we don't have any support of training data. So what we do by making predictions for these new locations where we don't have any support of training data is um, that we transfer our model to new space and assume that the relationships that have been learned based on the training data are still valid for these new locations where we don't have any support of training data. However, this new space might considerably um, differ in its environmental properties compared to what has been observed um, in the training data. And this leads to a question that has not been addressed by either spatial um, validation or spatial validation uh, variable selection so far. And this is what happens if the algorithm has never seen such environmental properties. And this um, can be in so far a problem as machine learning algorithms can fit very complex and nonlinear relationships here between predictor variables and the response variable. But at the same time, this makes um, them very um, um, yeah, problematic for extrapolations. So whenever we have gaps in a predictor space, like for example here, um, where we don't have any support of training data, this can be very problematic because um, the model simply has no knowledge about these environments and um, therefore doesn't know how the relationship between predictor and response looks like for, uh, looks like for these areas where we don't have, um, or for these areas that have predictor properties um, that are not covered at all by the training data. And what we therefore need um, to account for that is a kind of measure for unknown space so that we identify um, where we have locations that are so different in their environmental properties that we can assume that our model cannot make reliable predictions for these areas because these areas feature um, environmental properties that are just not known by the model because the model had, uh, has never seen something like that um, based on the training data that were used. Um, so we need to identify unknown space and our suggestion um, or um, how we define unknown space here first is um, as um, space with environmental conditions that are very different um, from the environmental conditions um, of the training locations. Um, so um, when we assume here that we have three predictor variables, one called A here, 
one called B and one called C. So we see that each training location um, is located somewhere here in that, um, in this case, three-dimensional um, predictor space. And if you now train a model based on these training data and want to apply that model to make spatial predictions, for example, for this um, new location shown here. So what we need to identify for this new location is if this new environment is known to the model or not. And our suggestion to do that is um, a kind of dissimilarity index that is based on distances in the weighted predictor space. So what we basically um, look for is um, how distant a new location is in its predictor properties to a nearest training data point um, compared to the distances that have been observed um, within the training data. And to actually map unknown space, um, we calculate the dissimilarity index for each new pixel or for each um, new location so that we can analyze for each new area in our um, area where we want to apply our model for um, how distant it is um, from what the algorithm has seen to identify if our model can have knowledge about these environments or not. Um, so maybe it's getting more obvious when we have a look at that um, with one example. So what we have here is a set of predictor variables, bioclimatic variables um, for Europe um, in this context. And as a response variable, we use a um, simulated um, response variable for um, virtual target um, that is here available in a spatial continuous way. And um, to estimate typical um, locations for field samples, we randomly pick 50 samples um, that we use as training data. They are shown here with a um, red symbol on that map. So we um, use those um, training locations um, to train a model um, that is able to make predictions of that virtual target variable um, based on our predictor variables. And when we apply random forest algorithm, just as one example, um, we get the following prediction patterns here. Um, that can be indicated um, by a cross-validated R-squared value of 0 0.95, so apparently a very good um, prediction model. However, we have said earlier on that we should only make predictions for these environments that have been known or that are known to the model. And therefore, what we need to do next is to identify where in our prediction map we can trust the predictions and where we should better not trust these predictions because predictions were made um, for environments that are completely different or um, very different um, from what the model had knowledge about um, based on the location of the training data. So we calculate the suggested dissimilarity index for each pixel in our um, data set and we um, see the results here um, for our case study. So in dark blue, we see areas that are identical or very similar to the training data. And with increasing um, brightness here, the dissimilarity increases. So we can see that, especially here in the West Coast of Norway or in the Alps, um, we have very high dissimilarity. So apparently these are areas that are very different in their predictor properties um, compared to the predictor properties that have been observed um, in the training data. And um, yeah, because we use the um, simulated response variable here, um, we have the opportunity to calculate um, the true prediction error in a spatial continuous way. So we see here the patterns of the true prediction error. Um, and we see that um, um, yeah, the patterns here correspond quite nicely to the dissimilarity index. So um, locations where we have um, yeah, large errors in our predictions are also the areas where we have a high dissimilarity um, index, so apparently locations um, that have been unknown to the model. So and to actually make a decision about the area of applicability that we define as the area um, to which we can reliably apply um, our prediction model to, um, um, we um, yeah, need to make the decision um, to which areas we should apply our model and to which areas we should not apply um, our model because um, these areas are too different um, compared to what um, the algorithm has seen. So what we do is to apply a threshold on a dissimilarity index and we derive that threshold from the dissimilarity index of the cross-validated um, training data so that we can now here present our predictions again, but this time only for the area of applicability and everything that is um, shown here in a pink color um, are areas that are located outside of the area of applicability. So these are locations um, that are too different in their environmental properties so that we can um, um, yeah, say that the model had no knowledge about um, these environments and therefore shouldn't know um, what to do um, in terms of predictions for these locations. Um, so why is it relevant to map the area of applicability? Well, the results um, that we create, uh, create based on um, combining remote sensing and machine learning are not just nice maps, but they are used for subsequent modeling. So for example, the um, frequently applied uh, global um, soil maps that are created based on machine learning, they serve as important um, input variables for further modeling, for example, on um, 
microorganisms in the soil, just to mention one example. Um, the um, results that we um, develop also serve um, for planning in the context of nature conservation or might serve um, as input for uh, planning in the context of nature conservation or risk assessment. And therefore we should only provide predictions um, for the area of applicability so that we can avoid large error propagation or misplanning. And finally also to keep trust in um, um, the methods and um, keep our results as transparent um, as possible. Um, and that will also be um, the focus of the um, workshop later on. Um, so what um, the aim of the workshop is that we first go through the basic workflow of um, applying machine learning to remote sensing data. And we will do that at a case study of um, a land cover classification for Münster in this uh, context, so the location of the previous summer school. So we will see in the workshop how we can um, yeah, apply machine learning um, algorithms to um, satellite um, data to create spatial continuous um, maps of land cover. Um, but then we will um, yeah, pick up the idea of the area of applicability and analyze for our created land cover map um, if we should trust our land cover um, predictions at each location or if um, we made predictions to locations that have been unknown to the model because they feature, um, in this case, spectral properties that have been very different um, to what has been covered by training data. Um, so that we can identify here locations in our prediction map that are outside of the area of applicability and where we shouldn't make predictions for. And finally, um, we will also have a look at um, the transferability of models. So we will um, have a look if we can transfer a model that has been trained at a certain location, so in Münster in this context, to make predictions for a completely new area. And to do that, we will transfer that model um, to a satellite um, image of Marburg here, also located in Germany. And we will see if we can um, yeah, apply the model that has been trained only in Münster to make predictions for um, this completely um, new location. And again, we will um, apply the concept of the area of applicability to assess um, the success of the model transfer. Um, yeah, so that's the idea for the um, workshop. And I'm looking forward to see many of you in that session later. Um, well, so our idea is that um, we look at the um, training data, so because we feed training data into the model, and um, the model is making prediction based on the information that it gets from the training data. So we assume that um, when we reach a threshold that is above um, the dissimilarity that we can observe in a cross-validated training data, that this um, should indicate locations that are very different from what the model has knowledge about, and that therefore the cross-validation error does not apply anymore to these locations. So we compared that for um, yeah, several simulations, and it leads to quite reliable results. But of course, there's also a bit of um, yeah, you can, I guess you can never find the exact threshold of where to make that decision, but you need to make it at some location to um, um, yeah, decide for which locations you make predictions for and for which um, ones you don't. And we um, assume that we take the cross-validation error as a good threshold so that we um, um, look at the dissimilarity of the training data based on cross-validation um, and yeah, limit the area of applicability only to those locations that have um, a dissimilarity index that is smaller or um, yeah, within the range of the dissimilarity index of the training data based on cross-validation. Um, at the moment, Euclidean distance, but I guess there are many uh, options to um, build on that and maybe to try out different um, distance measures as well. It's a weighted distance because um, usually we feed in quite many predictor variables. There can be very many hundreds or so on. And some variables play a role in the model and some don't. And of course, in the modeling. modeling, yeah. So it takes the weights from a variable importance um, of um, the model. So when we have a predictor variable that is, has a very high importance, it's very important um, um, that our new locations are similar in this predictor um, property compared to the training data, why when we have a predictor variable that is not used in a model at all, um, it doesn't matter for the concept of the area of applicability if we're distant in, um, 
uh, in our new location um, to the training data or not. Yeah. And that was one case study. Yeah. So we um, ha had quite few simulations for that case study with different um, settings and different sampling points and different um, sampling strategies. So if you have clustered um, designs or um, random designs and so on. Um, yeah. I have a question No, that's not um, part of this idea here. So, mm -hmm. then it should be part of the predictor variables. So we, as predictor variables, we should feed in any information about the seasonality. And then again, we would um, um, yeah, use the concept of the area of applicability to analyze if our model has seen this um, seasonality patterns before in the training data. And if it has, then we can apply that model to make predictions. And if it hasn't, because for example, it has never seen a winter season and we trained our model only in summer conditions and we shouldn't apply our model. Um, Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, if, if you aim at making um, predictions for this entire study area, so entire Europe in that context, um, and you have uh, time uh, to get new field samples, you could look for these areas now where you have a very high dissimilarity. So identify locations that have not been covered in um, the training data so far and then um, fill. Um, uh, your training data um, with new data that are taken from locations that are very distant to what has been observed so far. Uh, yeah, so that's another um, point that's probably up for discussion. So at the moment in that idea, one point is enough. So if we set one point um, in these locations um, where we have um, bright yellow colors, so very high dissimilarity, um, at that point, this location would be known to the model. So it might be still up for discussion if we should consider more than just one point um, to identify if an environment is known to the model or not. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be the next uh, speaker, who is a genius, uh, who is a PhD student at the Wachin University, so he is close by, and he will be also giving a whole day session. Um, So, so he has lots, lots of things to show. He's a real, real data scientist, um, uh, excellent developer, also programmer. And so also we're super happy. It's a happy occasion. He's close by, so it's a very simple logistics, um, but we're happy to have him. So please, Daniel, introduce your blog and tell us why you think, uh, well, make sure that you make it clear to people that are interested in your field and your experience to come to your blog. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I'm also glad to be invited here by Open Geo Hub and to have this opportunity to present at the summer school, even having two blocks. So um, I'm looking forward to that and thanks Tom. 
So yes, I am Dennis Macedunas from the University of Wageningen, and I'm part of the Laboratory of Geoinformation Science and Remote Sensing. So my background is that actually my bachelor's was back in Lithuania in Vilnius University, and I was doing ecology, which is perhaps a bit different from uh, what we're doing right now. Um, but it is very useful because it gives a bit of a context of why are we using um, all these techniques of uh, remote sensing, of machine learning, and so on, was the real goal of uh, why we're doing it in the first place. And from there, I went a bit more in depth into geoinformation science for my master's, also here at Wageningen University. And afterwards, I started my PhD, which I'm doing right now. And in fact, from this year, from the next month, I will also be a lecturer in the same group. So I'm uh, looking forward to uh, giving more lectures on these subjects. And uh, there's also a good opportunity for me to uh, practice a bit more of my uh, lecturing skills. So what is my PhD about? Well, actually, interestingly enough, uh, this relates quite a bit to what Hannah was mentioning because my work is also very much related to land cover mapping and machine learning techniques used in land cover mapping. So my PhD itself is funded generally by the European Commission and specifically the Joint Research Center. So it's two projects. One project is the Copernicus Global Land Services land cover. We call it shortly CLOPS for Copernicus Global Land Operations. Um, and it is a project to create a global land cover map at 100 meter resolution and updated for every year since 2015 with some additional goals where we also want to uh, make it harmonize with other land cover maps so that we could also get land cover information from the past before 2015. And also the future is to move to an even higher resolution at 20 meters using Sentinel-2. Um, so that's one of the um, projects that I'm involved with. And the other one is OpenEO, which is a Horizon 2020 project, which is also kind of the brainchild of Etzer. And uh, the idea of uh, this project is to make kind of like GDAL is for uh, all kinds of uh, formats for rasters and vectors, but in this case, using uh, um, cloud computing platforms. So different clients with different languages can create um, kind of a process graph. And then that process graph tells a backend, which can be any kind of cloud infrastructure to process the data that you want into an output that you want. And in both of these projects, they're very international and they have a lot of partner institutes. So mostly we're working with Vito in Belgium because it is also a partner in both of the projects. And uh, for the CIGLOS projects, we're also working with IASA in Austria. And OpenEO itself is a really pan-European project. We have people from almost every uh, country in Europe. So we have people, of course, from the University of Münster. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have uh, people from Graz, so from Mondialis in Germany, um, several institutes in Austria, so TU Wien and its offshoot EODC. In Italy, we are working with EURAC, which is also hosting one of our uh, use cases that we at Wageningen are working on, which is a time series brick detection, which I will also talk about more later. Um, Synergize is also providing some data and uh, uh, Selenix is providing a kind of app that you can use on your own smartphone to interact with OpenEO as well. So a bit about uh, my sessions of today. So I will actually have two sessions and they will be a bit different because I will talk about these two different goals that I have in my PhD and uh, in separate sessions. So the first one is about the global land cover fraction mapping. Um, it's my main topic of the PhD, so quite like Hannah was uh, mentioning just now, it's about using machine learning algorithms to map land cover. Um, in my case, I'm not just doing a classification though, I'm specifically doing regression because it's about land cover fractions. So in every pixel that we have, the question is how much of that pixel is covered by a particular land cover class. 
So maybe if it's some river next to some grassland, it could be 50% water and 50% grass. And then this does not map very easily to this discrete worldview where every pixel has an associated land cover class because it's like 50-50. So um, using fractional land cover, we can really show the real situation in the world more in detail. And we can also make use of this information for users to create their own land cover maps um, so that they can create uh, rules which they're interested in. So for example, maybe they're not even interested in grass and they're only interested in water. So you can make a rule saying that, well, if it's at least any water, then let's consider this to be water and then create a discrete map out of that. So in my session, that will be the practical part. So we will work on Google Earth Engine to make your own land cover maps that are um, these discrete land cover maps from the um, fraction land cover maps. And uh, in this session, I will also talk a bit more about different machine learning uh, techniques that I was using, comparing them together, seeing what algorithm works best for this regression task. So it's also linking a bit with the sessions that we had on Monday by Meng Lu. Um, and in the second um, part, so the second session that I will have, I will talk specifically about uh, land cover change monitoring. So uh, detecting breaks in time series and how we can use that to update land cover maps. And in that session, I will talk specifically about the algorithm that I'm working with, BFAST. So it's a break detection algorithm uh, that can make use of uh, univariate input to detect whether there are some deviations from the usual um, trajectory of the time series. And if so, that indicates that the land cover may be not stable. And in that case, um, we should update the land cover map in that area. And if there is no change, then perhaps it's better not to update the land cover map there because machine learning techniques by themselves will create a lot of noise simply because before um, in one year in the classification, it might think that this is maybe more water, so let's call it water. And in the next year, it might think, well, this is maybe a bit more closer to grass, so let's call it grass. But there is not an actual change between water and grass, rather it's just the algorithm that now is more confident than it's one than the other. So in that uh, section, I will also show hands-on how to apply the BFAS algorithm. Um, actually two algorithms, BFAS Monitor and uh, BFAS ON, which is a new algorithm that uh, I'm specifically working on and uh, updating. And otherwise you'll also just have a chance to take your time to explore global land cover maps from the Copernicus Global Land Services and uh, see what you can find because we also have a very nice visualization online where we can look at different countries. You can compare the land cover maps between them. You can look at the fractions and really go in depth. So this is the kind of scientific part of my presentation. Tom asked me to present a bit more about uh, who we are. So um, if you want to hear more about the scientific part, then just join my sessions. And for the rest, I will just talk a bit more about what I think about uh, software and uh, hardware and such. Um, so for myself, I'm a big fan of open source software. I've been a supporter of Free Software Foundation Europe and the Free Software Foundation for some time. And it's very nice to see that there has been quite some advances in that. So the Free Software Foundation Europe is a foundation uh, working to advance the use of free and open source software within Europe itself. And one of their most successful contributions so far has been the public money, public code. And the initiative says that if the government or other organizations that are funded by public money um, are generating code, then that code should also be public because people have already paid for it. And it should be something that the society can make use of in the future. And uh, also with the coronavirus crisis, they have uh, advanced this better because they have managed to convince that all these coronavirus tracking apps should also be uh, open source and 
that should increase also people's trust in these sort of apps that their data is not being misused, that it's really used only for the purposes that we need and so on. And then otherwise, I also um, like working on my own way. So especially I'm working pretty much exclusively on Linux, primarily using the OpenSUSE distribution, but uh, not only that. I've been using Linux since uh, exclusively since about 2009. And I find it to be actually really user-friendly and very good for scientific purposes. And for programming languages, I generally work with R, um, also quite a lot in Bash. Um, another programming language that you might not have heard of, but I like quite a bit is D. It is kind of uh, similar to C++, but is maybe like a mix between C++ and Java in the sense that it is a compiled um, programming language, but it also has a garbage collector, which means that it is much easier to write your code and you don't need to think about this memory management and so on. And it really has a lot of different ways of programming. So you can use it even as a scripting language and you can also use like contract-based programming and all kinds of other things that uh, um, you can think of from the different programming languages and it's integrated very well. The only problem with it is that it doesn't have too many packages. So um, you need to interface them through C packages and then the interface can be a bit more complicated to set up. Then I use also Python sometimes and I do some work in JavaScript and then C is also something that uh, sometimes I work with. But generally I would use R for the heavy lifting of geocomputation. Then I would use um, QGIS for visualization if there's something that is really um, complex that cannot easily be shown using R. Of course, it's always a trade-off. If you want to do something that is really reproducible, you should use R so that you don't need to do this over and over again. Um, but if you want to do something really specific and really well thought out and very well shown, then QGS is still really nice for that. And then all of this ties in very well with LaTeX for writing and Overly for collaborating with other people. And the code that I develop is all open source and it is accessible on GitHub. My username on GitHub is Great Emerald. And usually I license my software under GPL version three or newer. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions about that and such, then feel free to uh, ask me later. And then there was also a question about the programming style. Well, interestingly enough, when I learned programming, I didn't learn it just from courses on, on the university or otherwise. I actually started with gaming. I started out by learning Unreal Script, which is the scripting language for the Unreal Engine. At that time, it was Unreal Engine 2 and 3. And that is mandatory object oriented. Everything is an object. It lives in virtual space. You spawn something in the world and then you can interact with it. So I was really starting out with this object-oriented approach, but then when I went to do more things in R, then I learned to use also simpler constructs, functions and separate files to do a particular task. And in this case, I found that this really saves a lot of time in the short term. So we don't need to worry about these frameworks and complex uh, interactions between different classes and so on. Although it may cost time in the long run, so. I think that object-oriented programming is really great for frameworks. If you really want to have something that is complex that you want to um, reuse later on. And for one-shot scripts, it's better to do something that is simple just with functions and it's an easy way to handle multiple inputs and give outputs. So in R, one of the packages that I actually like that people don't really talk about often is optparse, which is a package to parse arguments from bash. And that makes it very easy because you can use your R script as kind of um, program by itself, which makes scripts very reusable. So you can just uh, write, say, I want to process this tile, you input the name of the tile and so on, and you get the output and you can just run it several times. You can make loops in bash based on which tiles you want to process and so on. And then this is reproducible. So every time that you want to do something again, you have all your arguments, you just rerun it from bash and that's it. The con is that it's really reusable. That means that you might just run it from bash. It's very easy. And then you will forget what arguments you used. 
So in that case, maybe it's also a good link to uh, what uh, we heard yesterday in the evening about the different ways to parallelize your code. You could use, for example, SnakeMake to really say what inputs you want to have, what outputs you want to have, and then this is documented in a, a file that you will remember later on what you were doing. And I'm also involved in some hardware maintenance. So in our group, we have, uh, well, I'm specifically maintaining four quite beefy Linux servers. So we have about 100 gigabytes of RAM and uh, around 60 threads for each of the machines. And we have also several tens of terabytes of uh, storage that is also RAID. So it's, very interesting because uh, we have really a lot of computation power within our group itself. So it's separate from the HPC that we in addition have in the university. So people can make use of both depending on uh, what is their um, need for the computation that they're doing. And even though they're beefy, they're not specifically running Fedora 17, the beefy miracle, um, but they are, some of them are running on CentOS, which is kind of a descendant from the Fedora. Um, I also sometimes help with maintenance of computers for a small business, and I also am quite used to building my own computers. The first computer I also built around 2009, and later on I built my own um, server, which is hosting my website and cloud storage and cloud computing, which is also very handy because that means that all of my data can be stored securely there. I can access it from anywhere, and it's not anywhere in every other um, company that may or may not respect my data. I really know that the data is there and it's really just mine. And uh, that server I'm running Gentle Linux on for security purposes. And finally, I'm also maintaining the BFAS package or trying to do so whenever I have the time. So the BFAS package I mentioned is about detecting breaks in time series. It has not had updates for some time. So we're trying to make a new version of it and uh, that's for the BFAS2 BFAS project. So on GitHub, you can find it, and it's the new code that we have. Uh, we aim to have a new release in CRAN with the new features that we have. So the BFAS01 method that I mentioned that I'm uh, working on developing, and also some bug fixes and such, and trying to improve also the things like documentation and plotting so that it's also more user-friendly for people so that uh, more people could uh, make use of it. And more help with maintenance is always welcome. We have kind of a small working group within our group to uh, maintain it, but uh, always it's nice to have more people working on it. And in fact, if we have more documentation, more testing, more people use it, that means that the effort becomes even more useful because as we know in free and open source software, if you have a problem, you solve it once, you solve it for all people in the world. And that is really a big strength. And then I'm also working on another package, which is the subpixel uncertainty confusion matrix, specifically for looking at this uh, um, estimation of how good are uh, length of refraction maps specifically. And uh, yeah, I'm also going to cover a bit in my session about the uh, spatial uncertainty part because that's also one of the things that I was looking into for the first part, the length of refraction mapping. Yes, so that's um, almost it. So the last thing that I wanted to say is that I generally have quite a wide range of interests. So I'm working with statistics and machine learning, including both global and regional models and also time series analysis, as you saw here. I'm also in, involved in another project that is specifically looking at both time series analysis and also scaling the gap between um, global and local. So connecting ground measurements with UAV measurements, with uh, measurements from airplanes and then to satellite level, and specifically also looking at induced fluorescence research, which is an upcoming branch of research where we have um, hyperspectral imagery from which we can deduce how much or how effective is the photosynthesis that plants are doing. And from there, we can also tell how productive our plant systems are as well as this determine what species these are, or detect some kind of uh, very high efficiency species that uh, we have not seen before. And using UAVs and um, 
yeah, from the field level to UAV level to airplane level. And generally integrating science is something that I really like. I think this is how we get a lot of new information, a lot of new ideas, if we can combine different fields together, because we can always learn from other fields that we don't have that much uh, uh, knowledge about. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Yes, I will cover this a bit. Um, so I tested about um, maybe nine machine learning methods. It's a bit difficult to say because there's also hyperparameterization and so on. And then I was also developing a bit of a method of how to deal with the imbalance in the data. Um, and I will mention what results I got from that. So um, which algorithms work better, which algorithm didn't work as well, and uh, what I tried and what works also specifically for this really big data, because some algorithms are actually really good, but maybe they're not so suitable for um, the big data analysis. Um, I will not go so much in depth in the basics of machine learning or specifically in the different machine learning algorithms. But of course, if uh, people are interested in that, then I can give more information about that. Indeed, I will go more about what machine learning methods I tried, what the results were, um, and also what kind of covariates were useful for um, making the predictions for the global line color map. Um, Yes. Yeah, exactly. So um, there's several methods we can use. Um, for example, if we're using uh, neural networks, then they can make use of multiple inputs and also give multiple outputs so that the result sums up to 100%. If we are using something like random forest that can only give one output, then we just use it for every class specifically. And then later on, we normalize it so that they all still sum up to 100%. And then uh, the... Um, Fraction is a representation of how much of the pixel is covered by the particular line cover class. Yes, so for OpenEO, um, the way that it works and the reason why it was created in the first place was reproducible research. So when you have a script, you should be able to run it even if one of the backends is not available. So that means that if you write a script and you're using Google Earth Engine as a backend, then you can, without too much trouble, convert that into a script that works also on other backends because the API is all the same. And another thing that is useful, even on top of that, is the user-defined functions. So for example, Google Earth Engine is one of our backends. So you can run uh, OpenEO code on Google Earth Engine. The backend will basically transform your R code or Python code into this uh, JavaScript or Python bindings that you have for Google Earth Engine. And then it will run the code there. And in addition, you can have user-defined functions. So even if you have code that is too complex to run, say, on Google Earth Engine, and you want to run, say, BFAS on it, so you can still put that into a user-defined function. And then the data will get transferred to a service that um, handles those functions. And then it will return back your data so that you can download it. So even if you have really complex code, you can still run it. And you can run it on different backends. So that it's reproducible. Even if the backend goes down, you can still go to another one and then hopefully still run your code. Yeah. 
Yes, so for the problem of computational efficiency, I think it's important to look at the different levels where we can optimize. Because in some cases, you might think that, oh, I should optimize this small thing that might be inefficient, but in the end, you might spend more time trying to solve this small problem than the algorithm would have uh, run in the first place. So it's important to know what the options are. So indeed, we have, say, different cloud platforms that we can run our code on. We can also optimize our code that it runs better. We have the different uh, places where we can run the code on, and we have different places where we have data. So knowing where the data is, what are the computational possibilities to handle the data as close to the data itself. So we don't need to download all the data, but rather we just run the code as close to the data as possible. And then looking at how we can more efficiently make our script so that it doesn't use the unnecessary amount of memory, because generally, at least in global research, I found that memory is actually more of a bottleneck than the CPU for most cases. So to make sure that it doesn't use too much memory, that we split everything into manageable chunks and so on. So I think that's also, yeah, it's important to know what are the possibilities. And for example, with the presentation of uh, yesterday by Marius Apple, that's also a very nice way to do it, having a way to chunk your data automatically into small chunks that can be parallelized, this already helps us a lot. So just by knowing what is out there, knowing how to apply it, this can help you more than trying to solve these problems by yourself because you might just spend more time doing that than uh, is necessary. Okay, thank you. She's assistant professor at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Also super happy to have her. She specializes in uh, using geostatistics to model health data. Uh, she published a book. Um, um, and so you can talk about it, but uh, yeah, it's fantastic to have you here. And uh, yeah, again, we uh, try to uh, find uh, new faces for uh, summer school. And we, we do try to especially look at uh, young female developers and uh, contributors, and you are one of them. So we're super happy to have you. So please uh, take uh, half an hour uh, to present uh, what you're going to do today. Thanks. So half an hour, but leave 20 minutes, 25 minutes. No, no, just, uh, just like this. Uh, this one. The slides are here, yes. Mm -hmm. Are you okay just like this? Right? Um, yeah, like this? Okay. Okay. All right, go. Um, hello, and um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be able to be here and be able to see so many great talks on your computation and also to talk with all of you. My name is Paula Moraga, and I'm an assistant professor of statistics at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, known as CAUS, in Saudi Arabia. I'm the principal investigator of the Geospatial Statistics and Health Surveillance Research Group. My research focuses on the development of statistical methods and computational tools for geospatial data analysis and health surveillance. 
I have developed methods to understand the spatial variations of temporal trends of diseases. And uh, here we apply it to monitor cervical cancer in white women in the United States. I've also developed methods to integrate data at different spatial resolutions. And here we apply it to combine point level and area level data of air pollution to produce a spatially continuous surface uh, of air pollution that could be useful for decision making at the local level. And I have developed point process models to understand how hepatitis C virus propagates in human livers. I also developed software, so my methods can be widely available and provide benefits beyond my own applications. I'm the author of the package Spatial API app, and this is a shiny web application for disease mapping and detection of clusters. And I'm co-author of a package called EpiFlows for risk assessment of travel-related spread of disease. I also collaborate with multidisciplinary teams, uh, looking at how diseases distribute in space and time and identifying risk factors. I developed a modeling architecture to predict lymphatic filariasis in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a disease also called elephantiasis. I also work on a project identifying risk factors of leptospirosis in Brazil. And this is a disease transmitted by the urine of the rat and very common in urban slum communities. And I work on a project assessing the effect of two interventions larval source management and house improvement on malaria transmission in Malawi. I recently joined CAUS and I'm uh, enthusiastic about continuing my research on statistical methods and computational tools to improve population health. And I'm very interested in these three areas that are precision disease mapping, digital health surveillance, and the development of interactive visualization applications. Um, so disease maps are very important to understand the spatial and spatial temporal patterns of disease and allocate resources. And often these maps are given at an aerial resolution. So here, for example, we, we have a map of Mozambique in Africa. And this map shows malaria prevalence in areas. So here we can see that in the north prevalence is higher and in the south prevalence is lower. But this map is not very useful for decision making. You know why? Anyone has an idea why this is not um, ideal for decision making? You don't see what? Yes, yes, so that's the reason. So here we have um, estimates in areas, but uh, we, don't, we don't see how disease risk varies within the areas. So in a given area, there will be locations of high and low prevalence, and here we cannot see them. So uh, what I want to do is to um, develop methods to disaggregate area level data to produce high resolution estimates of disease risk uh, that are useful for decision making. And here, for example, we can see that within a, meager, an, a given area, we can see locations of high and low prevalence. And this is much better for decision making to allocate resources in areas of greatest need. I'm also very interested in digital epidemiology. Uh, traditional surveillance systems are very important for the early detection of disease outbreaks, but they have a limitation, and is that information is, del is delayed. From the time that a person gets sick, decides to go to the doctor, goes to the doctor, have the laboratory test, and that information is in the system, it may take a few weeks. So this information is not useful for taking action in real time. Uh, nowadays, we have access to other types of data, for example, digital data. So we have access to Google searches where people search about 
uh, treatment for the illnesses or social media data where people um, sir, uh, talk about how they feel. This information is not produced for epidemiological research, but it's very useful to understand disease activity levels uh, in real time. We also have access to demographic and environmental risk factors and many diseases um, may be affected by uh, factors such as temperature, humidity, elevation, and so on. So um, my objective is to develop a surveillance system that integrates all of this data. So official disease data, real-time digital data, and demographic and environmental risk factors to produce local probabilistic predictions of disease activity in real time that could be useful for policymaking. And finally, I'm also very interested in the development of interactive visualization applications. Effective communication and proper and timely dissemination of information is very important for the development of uh, population health policies. And I plan to develop digital health atlases of diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular diseases, or infectious diseases, and also digital health surveillance systems to monitor diseases in real time. Okay, so later today I will give a tutorial on spatial modeling and visualization with our ILA. Spatial data can be categorized in three types aerial data, geostatistical data, and point patterns. So in aerial data, we have the region of a study partitioned in several sub areas. And in each of the areas, we know the number of cases, the population, and coverage. And here the objective is to estimate the risk in each of the areas. And we can do that uh, using models that include covariates and also random effects to model residual variation. In geostatistical data, we assume that disease risk is a spatially continuous process that we can measure at a specific locations. And here the objective is to uh, use models that allow us to obtain um, a spatially continuous surface of disease risk. And we can use models like this that again use covariates uh, based on, character on characteristics known to affect disease transmission, such as temperature, precipitation, vegetation, and so on and also a spatial and unstructured random effects to model residual variation. And finally, point patterns. In point patterns, the data are the locations of the people with the disease. So here, for example, um, we have the city of Valencia in Spain, and each of the dots represent the location of the people that have kidney disease. And here the objective is to understand what is the process that originates this data. So is this data at random? Is clustered? Uh, are the cases close to um, a contamination source? And also we can learn about the correlation between the locations and the spatial coverage. So in the tutorial, um, we're going to learn how to develop and interpret spatial models with ILLA. ILLA stands for Integrated Nested Laplace Approximations, and it's a computational approach to perform approximate Bayesian inference in latent Gaussian models, including spatial and spatiotemporal models. And we are going also to see how to create maps and other visualizations that facilitate the communication with collaborators and decision makers. The course is hands-on with three parts. Uh, in the first part, I will introduce geospatial data and the ILLA package. And then we will go through two examples, modeling aerial and geostatistical data. For the aerial data, we will see how to estimate lung cancer, lung cancer risk in Pennsylvania, in the US. 
And for the geostatistical data, we will see how to predict malaria prevalence in the Gambia. So here I'm going to focus on disease mapping applications, but these methods are also useful in other disciplines that uh, analyze georeference data, for example, in ecology to predict species distributions, in environment to estimate air pollution, or in criminology to assess patterns of crime. The tutorial will be based on this book, Just Spatial Health Data Modeling and Visualization with R, Ila, and Shiny. The book is published by CRC and it's also freely available uh, online at this URL. And it covers how to manipulate and transform spatial data and how to create maps with R, how to fit and interpret spatial and spatial temporal models with INLA and SPVE and how to create interactive visualizations, reproducible reports, dashboards, and shiny web applications to communicate results. And as I said before, the book focuses on, on health examples, but the methods covered are useful in, in any other discipline that uh, uses georeference data. Um, and finally, uh, I recently joined KAUST, and I'm looking for outstanding PhD students at postdocs to join my group. So if you are interested in just spatial data analysis with applications in health and the environment, uh, please get in touch. I will be very happy to, to discuss the details of these positions with you. KAUST offers an excellent research environment, free tuition, monthly living allowance, free housing, and it's a, an excellent university to study and research. Um, these are some references uh, about my work, and that's it. Thank you very much. Yes. yes, so I, well, the thing is that I, uh, yes, I, I am a mathematician and then I have a PhD in statistics and I started to work uh, during my PhD in the registry of cancer in Spain, doing uh, spatial models for cancer and doing uh, disease maps. And by that time I used uh, MCMC, like Markov Chain Monte Carlo methods, to estimate disease risk, and I, I use a software that is called Winbox. Um, so these uh, MCMC methods are very slow, like you need to um, run chains for a long period of time until they converge to the posterior distribution to get your estimates and then check if they converge. And with ILA, uh, like, like with these MCMC methods, you can, depending on the data, you can fit the model for days or for months. And with ILA, you will get the results in minutes or in seconds. So uh, it really changed everything for me because I, I could work uh, in, an e in an easier way. I could compare different models. I could uh, use, um, a, um, bigger data sets to, to, to do my research. And I, and I, I really like ILA because ILA allows you to specify, allows you to, to quantify the effect of the covariance on the response and also include random effects to model different types of variability, spatial variability, measurement error. And you do that and you propagate all of the uncertainties. So finally you get predictions uh, estimates of your of your parameters of the response and also with credible intervals that allows you to know about the uncertainty of your prediction. So I really like it. There's there's a question there. <laughs> uh, well, what I do is uh, when I want to include uh, covariates. First, I do a, an analysis 
uh, an analysis maybe with with the with explains or uh, with other methods to understand what is the effect of the coverage on the response and if i see that uh, the effect of the coverage is not linear i construct my uh, coverage so i can include non-linear effects like i can construct like piecewise wise linear functions or interactions between covariates, and I do this uh, by, by hand. Like, um, what I want to do now is explore machine learning methods, because maybe since machine learning methods uh, take into account all the nonlinear relationships and interactions between covariates, maybe that's better for prediction, because spatial models, like statistical models, are very useful to understand uh, what is the effect of the covariate on the response, but if you are interested in prediction, maybe machine learning methods uh, are better. So I, I want to, to see if I can, instead of um, introducing in my statistical methods only linear effects of the coverage, maybe I can introduce the output of machine learning methods to um, increase uh, uh, prediction uh, performance and also random effects to account for residual variation. Yeah, yeah, so that's right. Like if you jax or stand, you can like write your own model and you can write the equations the way you want. And with Tila, it's like you have a, a set of models and you cannot. There, there are some some tricks that you can do for multivariate responses and all of that, but I agree with you that. Uh, the, if you use MCMC, uh, is more flexible, but it's also more, so more. Yes, it depends on, on what you want. So if you want a, like uh, a standard disease maps or simple models, uh, geostatistical models are very good as well. But if you want a very complicated model that you want, I don't know, to incorporate mechanistic behaviors, maybe you you will need to use MCMC. Yes, yeah, so ILA can be used to, yes, to see the, the spatial and spatiotemporal patterns of COVID. But um, and the thing is, uh, what uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, what we wanted to do it was to predict the number of cases we were, we were going to see in the future. And for doing that, uh, like me mechanistic models were much better, like SIR models, susceptible infectious recovery models, where population was classified in different compartments. And there were like, uh, we model like the behavior of the population and how the people move from one compartment to another, and this is a different type of models uh, that I, I don't think uh, they can be fitted with the lab. Okay. Yes. 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 I haven't done that, but uh, you can do it. Like you. Yes. Thank you. 
Yes, yes, so yes, you're right. So uh, in the model, uh, we 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 take into account covariates that can affect disease and uh, whether it's one of them. And uh, we can develop a spatiotemporal models. And we can, like, if you are interested in knowing what is going to happen if temperature increases by one degree, we, we can do that. And we can generate our covariates and, and get predictions. Mm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not explicitly, but uh, if you understand the methods, it's easy to do it. Thank you. Yes, yes, it's book down. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to remind you, uh, the, uh, in the big hall, uh, we will start with Hana, and then in the in the small hall, uh, in the smaller room, uh, it will be Daniel's whole day, basically, uh, no moving. Uh, so, yes, so with this thing, I close the introduction section, and we see you in about half an hour. Thank you. Mm -hmm.